Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. At this time, we would like to inform you that the taking of photographs or the use of any recording device is strictly prohibited. We advise you that the aisles are used by our actors and technical staff, so please keep the aisles clear at all times. For your safety and the safety of our actors, we ask that you remain off the stage before, during, and after the production. And now, we proudly present That's Dinnertainment! Dinner theater goes back to the Greeks, Sophocles, Euripides. This is the first theater ever. Those giant amphitheaters, people would go there for the day. They'd bring their lunches and their dinners, and they'd watch a play. We're just doing the same thing, only in a lot tighter time and under lights and air conditioning. We've got it all in one place. My earliest recollection is that it was in the late 60s, early 70s. The Star Theater maybe came out of going back to the, the old studio days. You were on contract to MGM or Warner Brothers or whatever. And when the studio system sort of fell apart, you had these actors who were taken care of for decades by studios. And when that studio system fell apart and some people weren't on contract anymore, they still had to find work. And these people were not old. Some were in their 40s, 50s, 60s. And so they had the rest of their career. Well, where are they going? If the studios aren't putting me in movies, what can I do? I can take what the studio gave me, which was cachet around the country and recognizability. You can now cash in on. Audiences were intrigued. You mean I can see June Allison, Sid Caesar, I can see the stars of Leave It to Beaver, Gilligan's Island, Ann Miller perform here. Mind-blowing people that you've revered for generations of film going to see them live in front of you, in the round, performing right in front of you. That's an experience unto itself. So that was a huge success. That ran out in the mid-80s when it started to financially waver. The old stars were dying off. And so they realized, well, we've got this audience base now, so maybe we don't need to have stars. It's Two components, basically. You have the dinner and you have the theater. Technically, you have to figure out how that evening is going to work. Budget-wise, you have to figure out whether you have a buffet or whether you have a meal service at the table, how much is a plate of food? How much are you willing to spend on a plate of food? What is the audience size that you plan on serving? Is it 500, 300, 200? That's all related to this. And then how much of the ticket price is going to go to the show? Because we are a for-profit theater, unlike the majority of theaters across the nation who are not-for-profit, and they get money from grants and from lots of different sources, donations and that sort of thing, all we rely on is the gate. And what comes through the door keeps us alive. And so consequently, we have to think like a for-profit business. The difference is between like a regional theater or a community theater or a college theater is that the dinner theater is open 52 weeks a year and they do eight shows a year plus concerts on the days off and children's theater on top of everything else. So it is a well-oiled functioning machine.
I think that for me, the thing that's most unique about dinner theater is sort of the community that it creates. What's your favorite part about coming here? Uh, getting together with my sister. We don't get to really physically see each other that often, so it's a good time to spend with her. The memories, I can, we even would take from work, we would have work functions and come here, all of us girls. Bringing my, my daughters when they were small to see the, the Santa Claus ones, and then, you know, like this, a group of people. Just good memories of different, of all of us coming. <laughs> The food. <laughs> I think that paradigm of uh, relationship with the people on stage and that, that special bond between an audience member and a certain performer or a group of performers probably happens at any theater where you use those performers more than once and the audience comes back more than once. What you're doing is you're bringing the audience and the actor to a place every, you know, eight weeks. Who sees family? A family reunion every eight weeks. That doesn't happen. So when you really analyze it, you're seeing friends every six to eight weeks. And I think it's almost impossible for that bond not to happen. Again, my name is Dickie. If there's anything you need, please let me know, okay? Enjoy yourselves. What do you think it was? I, a lot of people thought, I think I said Vicky. <laughs> well, I thought it was Sticky. Sticky? Thought... <laughs> you can call me Sticky if you want. What's been going on? It's a doozy, makes you woozy. It's the new phenomenon. It's funny being a resident actor in an established theater for decades. You can't go to Target and go unnoticed. It's weird. I know I'm famous in Clarksville. It's a big deal. But these people have invested their time and their effort. They've celebrated birthdays seeing you perform, uh, anniversaries, um, and they've, they've bought season tickets for decades, and you've become part of their lives. For them to get to know me and see me at the grocery store or um, taking my kids to swim lessons and having the coach be like, oh, I saw you in a show last weekend. And it is, it's so great because they feel ownership over the theater because they know us, because they know we're part of the community and that we're going to the same grocery store and we're taking our kids to the same things. Also, they're patrons, so they're, it's like they're getting to be up on stage too because it's people like them. We've had people come in here, grandparents, parents, and kids. So I've got three generations of people watching uh, like a Mary Poppins. And then when grandma moves into the home, we've got two generations, but the kids remember. There's lots of ways that children's theater is beneficial for our main stage. The first way is well, for one thing, inspiring kids, showing them really great theater at a young age, because then they get hooked. So eventually, they could be our audience of the future, the little ones. You bring parents in who maybe are not spending money on themselves because they're young parents and all they're doing is spending money on their kids, and they bring them in to see Alice in Wonderland on a Saturday morning, and they have such a great time, and they see what we do here. So immediately, you might sell more tickets because you have parents who are like, you know what, this is great. We get to eat, we get to hang out, we you know, get to see great theater. And then you also, you know, I remember the first show that I saw that I was like, I want to do that. So you're creating the next performer. So it's, it's for so many ways we are creating a pipeline to to successful theater. At the basis of dinner theater, if we go back to what those two things are, they're human needs, to be entertained, and then it's sustainability with food. You need to eat, you like to be entertained. We could offer you both those things, and I think until they stop eating and wanting to be entertained, dinner theater will be around in some form. It is the most intimate, wonderful, immediate audience response I've had on any stage anywhere because you're surrounded on all sides. You've got to deliver a line so that everybody gets it. And uh, you have to be so entertaining that people put down their dessert fork and pay attention to you. 
And you know, I love chocolate cake and it would take me a lot of effort to put down that dessert fork, but I've seen it happen many times here.